Good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goods Weather Business School. I hope you are all having a wonderful holiday season and welcome to the final of our Business Over Breakfast series for 2021. And what a year it has been. We started this series in April 2020, and who could have imagined the change that leaders and businesses would need to embrace um, over that time? And we're still learning, and we're still changing, and we're still hopefully embracing. I heard on the news today that UPS has reimagined its uh, hiring process. And now, instead of taking two to three weeks to hire people, it was giving applicants a decision in 30 minutes or less. Um, and that's the sort of thinking that we hope Business Over Breakfast uh, um, helps fuel. So new ideas, uh, new approaches based on research, um, and also providing an opportunity to explore um, those by answering um, some, if not all of your questions. And what a journey we've had this year. We've explored topics such as technology and privacy, digital currency, business model innovations, the unspoken rules of leadership, collaboration to reduce social inequity, the ever popular uh, economy and me, and uh, this current series on the environment, social and governance, which we're continuing today to explore the topic of B Corps. Um, what is a B Corp? Why are they on the rise? Uh, what it takes to become one? What are the benefits of them? And joining us today to make sense of the rising B Corp movement uh, are the academic and program leaders of Gozueta's Business and Society Institute, along with uh, two noteworthy uh, executive practitioners. Moderating uh, the discussion is Brian Goebel. Um, Brian is the managing director of the Goizueta Business and Society Institute which is an academic research center focused on addressing complex challenges confronting businesses, people, and the planet through academic discovery and purposeful action. Brian oversees the Institute's collection of innovative programs and student activities. And I thought it's worthwhile sharing a few of those with you because they're fascinating. Um, one is the Start Me Accelerator, which boosts neighborhood vitality in Atlanta through micro business uh, development. Another uh, helps strengthen coffee grower communities in Latin America through women's empowerment. And the th a third is developing the next generation of principled social enterprise leaders through experiential learning. Brian is going to lead uh, us through a conversation with three panelists. And that'll take probably about the next 30 to 40 minutes. And then um, we will transition to uh, Q&A, which is such a critical part of Business Over Breakfast. As always, we invite you to put your um, questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And Brian will do his best to make sure that um, they are answered. And at the end of today's session, uh, there will be a short survey. What we're really interested in is one or two key takeaways from the session. That's really helpful to us as we um, think about topics and uh, faculty to, to bring to Business Over Breakfast. So um, I hope you have a wonderful morning. Hope you have a wonderful holiday season um, and vacation for those people that are, that are taking a rest. And I am gonna hand over to Brian. Thank you, Nicola. R really appreciate uh, you continuing the, the series uh, throughout 2021 and look forward to what's next in 2022. Um, really excited. We have an amazing you know, group of practitioners and academics to talk about B Corps today and, and really those, those companies that uh, in, in lots of thorough, authentic ways balance you know, profit and purpose. So to get started, um, I wanted to just share a couple of slides on some basics in case some folks are, are new to the B Corp movement. So let's start there and then I'll introduce our panelists and get into our robust conversation. So let me just share my screen here. Excellent. So, um, you know, what is a, what is a certified B Corp? Um, certified B Corps are a new kind of for-profit business. And I kind of want to underline that because I think sometimes um, because it's, it's for-profit businesses and, 
you know, making a, a positive social and environmental impact, people sometimes mistakenly think that these, these businesses might be, you know, social enterprises or, or nonprofits, but they are, they are for-profit businesses that, that truly balance purpose and profit. Um, there are more than 4,000 B Corps uh, in the world today that are, you know, headquartered uh, in more than 70 countries. And they represent a lot of industries, every industry you can think of. I think, you know, a lot of the B Corps that, that come to mind that we all know well, like Ben & Jerry's and Patagonia, et cetera, are, you know, consumer facing product brands. But there's lots of, you know, B2B uh, businesses out there and they vary in size as well from very, very small micro businesses um, with one or two employees to large, you know, global uh, multinationals. And as it says here, they have one unified goal as, as certified B Corps. And it's, it's not about being necessarily the best company in the world, it's being the best company for the world. And so I just wanted to share the, the certified B Corporation logo. This is something that um, after you see it here, I think you'll recognize it on the footer of lots of websites of some of your favorite companies and even around your house or your office in terms of um, you know, branded packaging on, on the back of packaging, a lot of the things that you use every day. So B Corps and, and how you become one, um, B Corps are certified uh, and verified by actually a third party nonprofit known as the B Lab, which is uh, headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And B Lab utilizes a 200 point impact assessment that's focused um, on stakeholders. And so uh, companies will, will go through this process and uh, be verified and audited to become a certified B Corp. And then every three years, have to be reassessed uh, to maintain the status. So it's really about that verified third-party audited, um, audited kind of transparent results. And so if you see these categories that are present here, it, it, it really uh, takes that concept of share, uh, stakeholder capitalism and brings it to life. So how is your company you know, performing um, and benefiting community? How is your, your company benefiting um, you know, the financial livelihood of workers? Um, how is your company interplaying with the environment? What does your footprint look like? How do you interact and value your, your customers? Um, and then lastly, what kind of governance is, is built into your corporate structure and decision-making that allows you to, to value equally all uh, stakeholders, not just shareholders? And, you know, the basic requirements kind of in these areas really, really kind of, uh, you know, flow down to three basic things that all B Corp certified B Corp share. Number one, they verify their social environmental performance, not only when they're certified, but every three years and uh, every year with their reporting. So it's not just your self-reporting on social media and values on your wall of your company, but it's verified third-party social environmental performance. Number two, it's that legal accountability that's that's that baked in. So, you know, your mission is locked and as you grow, it, it continues to be there. So it, it really um, holds that that uh, stakeholder concept and allows that to be e equally uh, valued as your, your company grows and attracts investors and evolves over time. And then lastly, and transparency and transparency matters. So all B Corps, certified B Corps report annually how they're doing on all of those particular areas um, that I, I mentioned on stakeholder side. And you know, you, you have a report that public, publicly appears on the bcorporation.net website that has category by category information along with disclosure details about your company. So there are a lot of B Corps, as I said, 4,000 of them. Um, um, just wanted to call a few of them out that you might know and, and know well and, and maybe are a customer of, but I think we all know the Ben and Jerry's and Patagonia and Allbirds and Eileen Fisher's of the world. Um, Danone is one of the, the largest B Corps. Uh, many of its subsidiaries um, are B Corporations. Um, seventh generation. So if you're, you got some cleaning products around your, your home, you might have that as well. And, uh, you know, to tech companies and education platforms like Coursera. And right here in our own state of Georgia, you know, we have Creature Comforts Brewing, uh, Gooder, and uh, 15 other B Corps. And so B Corps are not only on the rise across the country and world, but right here in Georgia, thanks to nonprofit organizations like Be Local Georgia, which is headed up by Nathan Stuck and his team. We're starting to see more of an ecosystem of support and, and networking and training to help people learn about B Corps, but also get through the process and um, build a B Corp community that uh, hopefully one day will rival some of the other states across the United States. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce our panelists and we're gonna deep dive into some conversations 
about B Corps um, from an academic perspective and why B Corps are on the rise, but most importantly, talk to practitioners that are business leaders of B Corp companies. So I'm um, happy to be joined by uh, Dr. Tuan Dogan today. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dogan is passionate about education and curious about the intersection of art, science, and technology. She serves as the Global Director of Social Impact at Coursera. Um, and in that role, she uh, develops all of the uh, in global, global impact strategies that transform lives through, through learning across the world. So for those of you not familiar with Coursera, um, it is one of the, the world's leading online learning platforms um, with a mission to provide universal access to world-class learning. So Dr. Uh, Dogan has worked a long time in the CSR uh, world and at IBM and right here at Emory as well and various nonprofits. So she's been on both sides of, of the table when it comes to CSR. So excited to, to welcome Dr. Dogan today. Next, uh, Ali Halinga is joining us. Ali is the community manager at Creature Comforts Brewing Company, which is uh, one of our favorite beers uh, here at Gazueta and, and, and based right in the Athens, uh, Georgia community. Uh, they are a certified B Corp. And in her role at Creature, she helps steward the company's community give back programs. And she is also the company's self proclaimed beekeeper. So we're excited to hear what a beekeeper does uh, from Ali. And you know, she began in her current role right before the pandemic started in January of 2020. And uh, one of her first projects was actually you know, shepherding uh, Creature Comforts uh, through the B Corp process. And lastly, uh, my colleague, Professor Wes Longhopper is joining us today. Uh, Wes has been with the Business School since 2012, and he's currently the Executive Academic Director of our Business and Society Institute. And he does a lot of uh, fantastic research on charitable organizations, environmental protection, and international law and uh, also teaches one of our most popular business school classes that talks a lot about the issues um, and, and, and topics and focus areas that B Corps are really all about. Um, he teaches a class called Business and Society, a favorite of our next generation business leaders. So welcome, I will, I will stop sharing my screen and dig into our conversation. So thanks for joining us, uh, Tuan, Ali, and Wes. Well, I thought we would start um, with the why. I think in, in business conversations, we ask with, we, we always start with what and how, but I think why really, really matters um, because it's a really intentional choice to become a B Corp. Um, so why don't we start with the why? And Wes, I'll turn to you just for more of a, you know, more of that 30,000 foot view. You know, according to, to recent reports from B Lab, since the pandemic started, more than 4,000 companies have applied to become a B Corp. In fact, there's a really long line um, of, of companies lining up to get through certification for the first time. And if, if they are successful, there'll be 8,000 B Corps instead of eight, uh, 4,000 as there is today. So tell us a little bit about you know, why the rise in B Corps? Why are so many more companies you know, pursuing this um, in, in a very serious way um, from maybe a few years ago? So we'll start there. Sure. Um, thanks for the introduction, Brian. Uh, thank you, Nicola, Pam, and everybody in, in your team, and uh, Tuan, Ali. Uh, so good to, to spend the morning with you. Um, <clears throat> so those of you that know me know that I'm a sociologist, and I tend to always think, say that things are due to changing context. I think that's really the case here. Um, some of this is a direct response, I think, to these monumental challenges that are they're facing not just business, but society writ large, right? Climate change, racial injustice, the pandemic. Uh, so I think a lot of this is about this sort of notion of reimagining capitalism and thinking about, is there a different way to do business uh, that prioritizes uh, stakeholders, um, including the environment and your employees, uh, thinking about governance. And then B corporations really are this organizational kind of embodiment of that commitment to, to stakeholders. Um, I think a lot of it also has to do with, with trust. There was a recent um, Edelman uh, survey that says that we trust businesses more than we trust government and we trust the media. And that's the first time that we've seen that. And I think it's important for businesses not to take that trust for granted. And what the B Corp certification allows is um, for verification. Uh, there is increasing pressure from consumers, investors, and perhaps most importantly, organizations own talent to verify commitment to equality, verify commitment to a healthier planet, and the B Corp certification is this powerful, transparent way to really verify that commitment. Um, it's also becoming an increasingly competitive landscape. I think that partly is what's shaping this, this rapid uptake in B Corps. Um, we see this in business schools, right? We, uh, we have a rapid 
growth in courses and programming related to ESG, sustainability, and social impact. Part of that is a response to market forces as companies develop more capabilities in this space. It's also pressure from our students um, who, are, who are pushing for more ESG related programming in their business school experience. I think for B corporations, the, that logo is a powerful signal to consumers um, that, that we as a company have a rigorous way of demonstrating our commitment to people on the planet. It's becoming an increasing way to attract talent. A lot of my students um, want to work for B Corps, and so they go to um, the B Work site to try and find jobs uh, that, that B Corps are, are offering. A lot of my students have changed their yogurt consuming habits because we talked about uh, B Corps in class and they all discovered that you could buy B Corp yogurt at almost any grocery store. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that B Corp certifications only work, if the certifications like this only work if they're difficult to get. And so I think some of this is driven by companies who are trying to, to compete with other companies on social impact and the certification, if you can get it and achieve it, and um, that, that can be a differentiator. I think it's also important in this space to recognize that it's not just competition, but there's also tremendous cooperation and collaboration. Uh, companies have shown a willingness to work together in this journey towards B Corp certification. I'll give you one example. Um, the B Corp uh, movement uh, itself has developed principles to help uh, bigger corporations become certified B Corporations. Um, these bigger companies like to know North America um, are part of a coalition called the B Corporation Movement Builders. And a big part of that movement is developing scalable collaborations uh, through lots of peer learning and knowledge sharing that allow for bigger companies and public companies to also pursue uh, certification. There's also the B Corp uh, Climate Collective, which is trying to do the same thing for companies that are committed to producing net zero emissions. So I would say it's this partly these structural changes. It is this idea of trust and it's becoming a way to verify that trust and then competition and a lot of collaboration. Oh, thank you, Wes. We really appreciate that overview. And I think, you know, you underline why this is really a movement. It's not one single driver, you know, it's really different um, elements across the ecosystem. And uh, I, I can uh, attest as well, our students are very passionate and um, voting with their dollars and, and looking to put their talents to work at, at B Corporation, as you mentioned. So Tuan, I'll, I'll turn to you, um, you know, why did, why, why, why B Corp and why, why Coursera, you know, um, followed that route? You know, you guys were around since 2012, you know, weren't, weren't a certified B Corp until February of 2021 this year. So, so new to the official certified B Corp world, you know, you've, you all have been hugely successful, 82 million learners, you know, corporate clients numbering over a hundred of the fortune 500 companies. So why, why did Coursera become a certified B Corp? But tell us a little bit about your why as a, a, a tech and learning platform. Sure. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for the invitation. And hello to everyone uh, uh, who's participating in this executive education uh, webinar around B Corp, a very important topic, and uh, happy to share the platform today with Ali and Wes. So, um, Brian, you mentioned that I'll just share a little bit more. Coursera is the world's leading online learning platform for higher education. Um, we believe that anyone anywhere in the world can uh, transform their life through learning, and our platform makes that available. You mentioned 82 million. We're actually at 92 million learners across the globe, and we partner with um, over 6,000 companies and campuses, including, like you said, over 100 Fortune 500 uh, companies that use our platform to advance learning. And some of that is through, you know, skills and certifications and degrees, but also a lot of reskilling and upskilling with workforces around the world. Uh, all of us can agree that over the past year during the pandemic, online learning really shaped the response to education. And in fact, in the past year, we gained more than 20 million new learners. So as we're approaching our 10 year anniversary, we did as a company think about our purpose and our strategy and our practices. They've always been consistent with B Corps requirements, but going through the rigor of the certification process really shows our formal commitment, um, commitment to continue these efforts, to reduce barriers to education, to make a world-class education available to anyone across the globe 
as we see now with um, people having more digital access, we've always known that education has been a tool um, to opportunities and advancements. But now that more people across the globe have digital access, we can see that it's um, even more of an equalizer, um, just being able to pursue an education and to upskill and reskill. And so becoming a B Corps for us really shows our commitment to a higher standard of purpose, um, both to our stakeholders, to our shareholders, and the impact that we wanna make that is validated, like you said, by a third party, um, and then our commitment to public transparency as well as legal accountability. Well, thank you, Tuan, for, for sharing that. And uh, I'm glad you have 10, more, 10 million more um, users than I had even uh, quoted. So fantastic growth. And says a lot, you know, of making that formal commitment, embracing the rigor. Um, and I think that says a lot about the B Corp community. So Allie, you, you operate in a little bit different world in the, the world of uh, beer making, a little different than Coursera and online learning. But, uh, you know, Creature Comforts got its year its start, you know, seven years ago um, and officially became a B Corp thanks to your, your, your efforts um, earlier in 2021, August of, of this year becoming the 16th, I think, uh, beer brewing company in the United States to achieve certification. And, you know, very similar, you've been very successful as a company, your, your scales, your sales have skyrocketed, I think up, up, up nearly 3000% since you guys opened in 2014. And, you know, we see your beer in Marvel movies. We know Thor likes his Tropicalia amongst many other uh, beer drinkers uh, around the country. So tell us a little bit about, you know, Creature Comforts and, and why you opted into becoming a a certified B Corp. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, thank you, Brian, for the introduction and for having me today. I'm really excited to share about B Corp movement with all of you guys. It's something that I really geek out about. So any opportunity we have to share and talk about our certification journey, I am all for it. Uh, but just like Tuan and Wes have mentioned, businesses, I strongly believe, have a big role to play. And we can't leave a lot of this pressing work to local you know, government officials and nonprofits alone, I really think businesses have a role to play. And so the why for Creature Comforts, it really all started for us is we were looking into some certifications. You know, There's a rapid growing number of beneficial certi certifications out there. Um, but even some of the gold standards for certifications are very limited to their specific area of focus. So if you think of organic or cruelty-free or non-GMO, these are all very important labels, don't get me wrong, but due to their singular focus, they kind of lack the complexity of all that it really takes to be in ethical business. And in some of our earlier days as a business, we were researching certifications you know, across the board. And for us, B Corp, quickly rose to the top as this gold standard. And in my perhaps slightly biased opinion, the B Corp movement is really one of the, the most important ones of, of our lifetime, just built off the simple fact that business impacts and serves more than just shareholders and that we have an equal responsibility to our community and to our, to our planet. And at Creature, we've always strived to do the right thing. So not the quick thing, not the popular thing, not the pressured thing, but the right thing. And internally, we say that we want Athens, Georgia, our hometown and our headquarters to be better off because we're there. And as such, we are committed to using our business to work towards a more inclusive and sustainable economy. And together with the Athens community, you know, we really do want to, to do our part to reduce inequality, to lower poverty levels, to create a stronger community, create a happier and healthier environment and create jobs with, with purpose. And so pursuing B Corp status for us really allowed for us to formalize a lot of the work we were already doing, in addition to giving us a very clear roadmap forward for what the future could look like for creature comforts. And just like Tuan was saying, I mean, before embarking on our, our certification journey, we knew we were doing some amount of good, but since completing the B Impact Assessment, ultimately becoming a certified B Corp, we're now hyper aware of areas where we excel at as a business. 
and also areas that we now know that we can really dig in and improve and continue down this path to be a business as a force for good. And so in a way for us, I think this B Corp certification was the perfect time for self-reflection for our company. As I mentioned, I, I started at Creature in, in 2020, but our, our B Corp work started all the way back in 2018 when the idea first came to us, but really started working on this certification in earnest in 2020. And as you all know, that was a, a crazy year and a lot has happened and that's forced us to really evaluate and be self-reflective. And it just, in times of uncertainty, this certification really provided you know, a light to us in the right direction. Uh, and then finally, while it's not why we necessarily obtained the certification, the benefits of this designation are are many and perhaps maybe some like potential selling points for your leadership or your board of directors. I really do think the status has allowed, allowed us to connect with consumers, to connect with consumers who are like-minded and socially conscious, who are very thoughtful about where they're putting their money. And as Wes said, I mean, in recent years, a lot of potential customers, including my own millennial generation and Gen Z, have increasingly developed a more conscientious approach to their purchasing habits. And recently, we've also seen that our B Corp status has helped us attract talent. And these days, more and more employees who are coming in for interviews are mentioning that they saw our B Corp status and that, you know, they want to work for a company whose sole pursuit isn't profit alone, who's also in it for the community and for them and for their planet. So I do think the certification can give folks a leg up in hiring and retaining those passionate individuals who really want to help your company go further faster. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Allie. And that, no, it's great. I, I took down a lot of notes, but you know, your work and striving not to just be the best in Athens or best in Georgia, but really best for, you know, our community. And you, you bring up, and I think Wes has some research on that, how many different certifications are out there, but why this one is mm -hmm. different in matters. Obviously there's that rigor piece, but it also is one of the only ones that covers your entire company, your entire operations, not a single product or not only sourcing or not only, you know, workers, but, but all, but all stakeholders, like you mentioned. So thank you for sharing more on your journey and glad to hear that there's some, some benefits already, even, even as a, a newer B Corp. Mm -hmm. Well, next, uh, I, I want to turn to corporate social responsibility. I think ESG and corporate social responsibility have been, you know, connected and talked about, um, and, and as all of these kind of our, our ESG series, um, back to back, but you know, this was a term that officially was coined in the 1950s by American economist Howard Bowen, and then started to really put being put into practice um, in the United States and around the world in the 70s and 80s. And I think in the 90s and early 2000s became a core element of a lot of the, the branding and marketing of companies, which has led to some good things, but also you know, some of that washing that um, we're all aware of as well. So wanted to kind of you know turn to you, Dr. Dogan. Next, you know you've worked in in CSR for many years, um, and I know you've you've been at companies and leading that effort at, at, at companies like IBM. You've been at it the other side of the table at nonprofits and higher education institutions that um, might be benefiting from you know CSR engagement, and now at Coursera B Corp. Now, how how would you define you know CSR today? And, you know, how has that definition, if, if at all, kind of evolved um, over maybe the last 10 or 15 years? Love to get your perspective. Sure. Thank you, Brian. And I'll just ask everyone to sort of skip with me down memory lane a little bit um, as I talk about a couple of milestones that I learned in my career and how CSR has changed. So I started a career in philanthropy in the early 2000s. And then in 2008, I switched to corporate philanthropy with IBM. And at that time, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, really referred more to a company's um, responsibility in regards to philanthropy and charitable giving, employee matching, and volunteerism. And in fact, at that time, uh, people used terms like community relations or corporate citizenship. And then around, around 2000, 
there was more of a focus on sustainability and how a company um, thought about the environment and the impact that they were making on the environment and on society in general, um, being very thoughtful about not compromising the environment by the decisions that they were making. So the company's focus um, on sustainability also included collaborating more with municipalities on issues like uh, infrastructure issues like water, transportation, power. And there was a move around smarter cities. Uh, some of you might rem remember there were a lot of advertisements around smarter cities. In fact, Atlanta, maybe 2012 or 2013, I led a smarter cities um, engagement with the city of Atlanta, still at IBM at the time. Then in 2015, there was a call to action from the United Nations around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Those are 17 goals that focus on an array of issues like education, poverty, hunger, uh, climate action, water. And so companies started focusing more on how do we collaborate again with municipalities, with governments, with nonprofits um, to, to focus on these issues, the UN SDGs. And at that time, companies decided uh, more than just uh, giving dollars, but how do we give you know, the expertise, our human capital? So there was a move around skills-based volunteerism and deployment of resources to collaborate um, with communities. And in fact, in 2017, I was deployed to Johannesburg, South Africa as a member of Corporate Service Corps, which was a service corps um, sort of designed around like a Peace Corps where companies would send top talent, IBM specifically sent a team of people um, to different places around the world to focus on specific issues. When I was in Johannesburg, we focused on Internet for All South Africa, where we were looking at um, providing access to 20 million South Africans by 2020. Again, that deployment was in 2017. So 20 million people to have access to the internet um, over a three year period. So companies then started moving from where we started like community relations and simple volunteerism, collecting money or goods to working more closely with cities and muni municipalities looking at uh, issues of infrastructure, and then moving to the UN SDGs. And today it's a more comprehensive focus on ESG, again, environment, social, and governance. You have those three pillars that encompass all the things that have happened over the last 20 or so years with companies, but now specifically around sustainability and the environment and what we're doing collectively to make an impact on society today, but to think about how our decisions are going to make an impact on the society of the future. We have the social, which still focuses on building community, engaging in our employees, volunteerism, diversity and equity issues. But then we have this governance pillar, which really is about advocacy and working with um, elected officials and influencing policy. And so we can see that the CSR movement, if you will, is now a lot more comprehensive and definitive about how companies are really being strategic to work with communities and governance governments to make sure that the impact, not just what we're doing with our goods and what we sell and our supply, but we're making a positive impact on society as a whole across those pillars. So I really look at um, ESG as a very comprehensive movement. We see now companies are looking at how do we measure um, more specifically in those three areas. And then lastly, I'll say, Brian, a lot of uh, students especially come to me and say, hey, I want to build a career in CSR. And I say, what are you really interested in? And I definitely encourage people to think about their area of expertise. I mentioned I started in this field in philanthropy. My background is education. So I was really um, focusing on educational philanthropy. And as the course of my career built across the last 15, 17 years, it's really been around how do we make a significant 
difference in education. So it's no surprise to me or others that know me that I would end up at a company like Coursera and continuing uh, to make a difference in the education space. And I would just add, you know, encourage other people to find your target area, that space where you're really interested and you want to build expertise, whether that's sustainability, the environment, whether it's around climate, whether it's more in the social space or more, or whether it's more around governments and uh, policy and advocacy, legal issues. Um, I think there's a wide range of careers that people can really go into, but really focus on ESG as a whole. Oh, thank, thank you, Tuan, and, and thank you for, uh, you know, taking us down that road of evolution. And, you know, um, and it reminds me of some of the conversations we have with our students, you know, people just as individuals really see how they can be change makers um, in a far more comprehensive way. And as you, as you um, documented well, you know, instead of companies only leveraging maybe five or 10% of what they do around philanthropy and volunteerism, bringing their whole selves as a change making organization to being thoughtful about, you know, that comprehensive approach and, and, and what they, they can do for social good. So thank you for that. So Wes, I, I know you've you know researched and are, are are closely watching kind of the world of CSR, you know B Corp certification, um, and and those in the movement kind of talk about it being the, the the gold standard of CSR. So talk a little bit about you know not necessarily where where B Corp has it right, but you know it's new. It's only been around for about ten years. You know where are there areas of imperfection where there's still some, some work, work to be done, in your opinion, in terms of um, the B Corp certification, you know, really being that gold standard. Yeah, um, so B Lab, the nonprofit that certifies B Corporations, has done a tremendous job of creating a comprehensive certification with a lot of transparency, a lot of rigor. They can tailor it to your size, tailor it to your sector. And I think that that's why it is the, the gold standard, but no certification is perfect. Um, some topics are still limited in their incorporation to my knowledge of in the certification. One example is around climate change. Um, B-Lab has encouraged B corporations to accelerate their emissions reductions, uh, commit to net zero emissions by 2030. I think there are over a thousand B corporations that have signed on to a pledge to try and meet that goal, but it's still not baked into the certification itself. And that's what, um, in the climate world, is what we're really wanting to see is our ambitious commitments to uh, net zero emissions that are um, accountable and, and they're verifiable. And I think uh, B-Lab is trying to do some stakeholder engagement to figure out how to, to think about that in the context of the certification. But that would be one topic that where there's a lot of movement, a lot of expectations and um, uh, trying to figure out how to, how to do that. I think another challenge for especially for bigger corp companies is how to think about your supply chain. Um, this becomes especially important when thinking about issues like human rights uh, and labor rights. So some larger B corporations like uh, Seven Generation and Natura have done extensive work with suppliers to try and track and measure human rights impacts, um, policies around inclusive hiring, child labor, uh, access to collective bargaining. Other companies that want to do the same uh, could use that B impact assessment to, to think about their own targets and their own uh, um, goals in that with their suppliers and develop their own um, kind of strategies and benchmarks and metrics using that B impact assessment. But I think it becomes much more complex when you have larger companies with global supply chains to think about um, how do I ensure that not just my, my company is certified, but how do, I, how do I ensure that my supply chain kind of meets that same standard. Uh, and then like any kind of certification, it's not so much about what's excluded, but what it takes to get there, um, particularly for smaller and newer companies. Um, a lot of the, the baseline assessment consists of policies you need to put in place uh, first in order to then collect data and set targets. So some research has found that for smaller and newer companies, that can take a lot of time. It takes a lot of talent, a lot of work. And some of that talent and time could go to other things like growing sales uh, and, and marketing. And so I think that there is a potential trade-off. So what we have seen is that smaller and newer companies that become certified tend to grow a little bit slower in terms of revenue uh, and employees. But it, it also, you could argue that that's not the goal. The goal is to become certified, become a purpose-driven organization to verify that and then grow later. But I think that is uh, another, one of the challenges facing smaller companies is how do I balance my commitment to, to the certification while also growing the company um, for the future? Oh, thank you, Wes. And um, it's always good to have a business school professor share a little bit of that nuance and complexity um, as, as, you know, I think getting comfortable with, 
with that imperfect is really important. In fact, I think Patagonia CEO in New York Times um, corner office, I think last week talked about that, that, you know, being a leader kind of in this B, B movement is, there's a lot of imperfection, but, you know, it's still important to, to take action and the, and the courage to, uh, to move forward in that space. And I, I want to give a shout out to Brian. So Brian, this semester has taught a lab with our students to help two companies pursue the certification process. And we've seen this at other business schools too, that this is a really great way for students to kind of look behind the scenes, get that experiential opportunity to help in the certification process. It also helps those smaller companies who have some smart business students to help uh, do some of that planning and lay out the, the, the path towards certification and help companies build some of those, that policy framework. And uh, the Be Local organization uh, run from some folks at UGA, Nathan, has done a tremendous job of um, creating sort of a, a, a way for students to get involved and help those smaller companies um, be part of this movement. So thank you, Brian, for, lead, for doing that at Quizweta. No, it's been, it's been great. And um, it's nothing like learning by doing. And so I know uh, Allie and her team uh, at Creature has benefited from the UGA course. And we're, we're happy to be fast followers and, and offer that course here as well. So we're, we're short on time as always. Um, Want to get to the Q&A uh, portion of our discussion. And I see the Q&A is already populated with a lot of really important questions on certification standards and advice. So I know that's where we're closing. So uh, Ali, maybe I'll just turn to you. You know, Peter Drucker famously said that, you know, what gets measured gets managed. And obviously ESG for a lot of people, um, can be kind of words that float around and, and values and, and conversations, but you know, how does it really take hold in operations and, and the certification and, B, and the B standards help with that? So tell us a little bit about you know, your, your certification you know, efforts, you know, where have you had to really focus? Um, as you said, you, you looked at this in 2018, you became a B Corp in 2021 officially. Mm -hmm. You know, what have, what have these standards, where, where have you focused your implementation efforts? What, what's been really rewarding and what's, what's been hard? You know, what's been honest, what's been, what's been challenging? So we'll turn to you first on that. Yeah, of course. And before I dive into that answer, quick plug for the work you were doing, Brian, and UGA's B Collaborative. When I say that this group of students was catalytic to our B Corp certification, I truly mean it. And we may still be sitting in the verification queue had it not been for that wonderful a group of MBA students. So definitely reach out and explore partnerships with your local university. That is a huge perk of being in a college town, Atlanta or Athens, having access to really smart folks at the table and just allowing them to guide you through the certification journey. But back to the original question. So Primarily in my role at Creature, I oversee our company's community give back programs. Uh, and in addition to stewarding our philanthropic work, I really oversaw our B Corp certification. Um, and again, that self-proclaimed beekeeper title. But what's made my job increasingly easy is that Creature employees really believe in what the company stands for. And our B Corp certification pro like process really got every single team from every department across the co uh, company just fully engaged and accountable in this work. And so many folks at Creature played a critical role in getting us to the end game. And that has really created this amazing momentum and energy moving forward. So while I may be the beekeeper, it's really been a company-wide effort to implement and live out these B Corp values on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I will say a lot of the work I do on the day-to-day -day basis really falls under that community impact area. So that's where I help the company make some of these incremental point gains. But I did just wanna share, as our beekeeper, I have my hands in a lot of different projects and departments across the company really just advocating for you know, B Corp to be brought into conversations when we're talking about opening a new facility in LA or when we're looking at purchasing a new piece of equipment and just making sure that this remains top of mind and kind of want to take a minute and brag on some recent wins that my teammates and colleagues have been able to accomplish that has really stemmed and started from the B Impact assessment, seeing where we could improve and dig in. So Recently made a really exciting move in the sourcing of more local ingredients. So over the past seven years of our, our existence as a brewery, we've utilized a lot of locally grown malted grains 
for various small batch and limited release beers, but um, starting in 2021, so it's actually alive and well, we have started partnering with Day Spring Farms and they are just 20 miles down the road from our brewing facility in Athens. And with Day Spring, we are sourcing organic wheat to brew Athena. And I know I've got some trop lovers on the call today. Athena is one of my favorite beers. It's one of our core brands that's sold year round across the state of Georgia. And for me, it's really exciting to see this change on a much larger scale than just small batch barrels that we create every once in a while that you know, we are committed to making these improvements across our supply chain. And on the other hand, you know, our talent and culture team is really working to ensure that all Creature employees don't just have a living wage, but they have a thriving wage and really working with them to define what that means in light of like the B impact assessment and just knowing as a business, we want to create opportunities for people of all backgrounds and all experiences to live with dignity and support themselves and their families and make a contribution to their communities. So that work has been really important um, to watch that team go through. And it's really been exciting work to be a part of. And then one final parting thought was that when we certified, y'all, we were at 80.4 points. And as a reminder, the threshold to certify is 80 points. And within craft beer, we are a very collaborative industry, but we are also a competitive industry. And so what's kind of fueled a lot of friendly competition is trying to see if we can now outscore some of our brewery friends when we go to recertify. And I really think that's been a fun game for our CEO and some others to play of like, what can we do? How can we get better? What can we learn from our industry peers to really be better. So really in my role, while I may not be our sole point earner and, you know, helping us move the needle, my job is really to advocate for these B Corp standards and best practices to remain top of mind across the company. Oh, thank you, Allie. And, um, you know, the beekeeper sounds like the chief instigator in, in a positive way. And, and obviously I think, you know, just showcasing how the standards not only help you manage, but manage with great intentionality. So thank you for sharing that. For sure. Um, Tuan, I'd love to just, you know, close with, with you more on this words of advice. You know, there's many folks on today's webinar, as we're seeing in the chat and, and, and Q and a that are, you know, interested in dipping their toes in, you know, looking into pursuing B corporate, B Corp certification. What are some important things to consider before you, you know, begin this journey? Um, any, any thoughts on, on, on where to start and what are some of those kind of critical practices to uh, think about? Sure, I would certainly say, uh, first of all, I like that beekeeper title, <laughs> Allie. So, you know, I would say to organizations, think about the beekeeper or beekeepers putting together a group of, of colleagues from different functions at your company um, to think about these practices. Also get some good buy-in from your executive staff and board prior to beginning the journey. Um, looking at other similar situated companies, you a lot of that information is public on the B uh, Lab site to look at the questionnaires and look at some of the types of questions that they are asking. And also think about um, just not where you are today, but your long range goals and planning. Um, for example, like with Coursera, we are already B course uh, certified, but as we think about our role as a global entity, one of the things that we've had to do in this past year is to operationally think about a work from anywhere policy. Um, and so as we get ready for recertification in a few years, we'll be able to report out that now we do have a work from anywhere policy. And so we realized early on that in order to recruit and retain top talent from anywhere in the world, we needed to, you know, uh, get down those uh, commute times. People don't need to necessarily go to an office. I am based here in Atlanta. I've never been to a Coursera office uh, since I've been at Coursera. We have pop-ups. So recently we had a pop-up in Atlanta where I met colleagues from DC, Chicago, Florida, Texas, Colombia. Um, so there are ways that we bring people together, but think about where you are today and your long range goals for how you want to plan and, and different um, policies that you can make for your company, 
um, for your employees, with vendors and suppliers. But the big thing is pulling together that B team, designating a beekeeper. I love that title, Allie. I'm going to keep that. And then making sure you have good buy-in from your board and executive staff and really look at those questions because each industry has different questions. Get an idea of the kinds of things that you're going to be asked so you can do a self-assessment before you actually answer the bee lab assessment. Yes, thank you, Tuan. So get your, your, your kind of you know, champions together, those beekeepers, you know, buy-in from, from leadership, all those yeah, critical components. So thank you for, for sharing that. So I'd love to just, you know, dig into some of the Q&A. I see a lot of really important questions. Um, uh, Antonio had a great question that, you know, is a reality that we're all facing, right? Our society is extremely polarized, particularly here in the United States. Um, Antonio would love to just know a little bit about, are there any thoughts uh, or concerns related to B Corporation, you know, your, your pursuit of that in terms of would that alienate any, any customers? Would that create any, you know, political discussion? Just wanted to, to see if, if politics come into play or polarization or if the certification is, is something that, that uh, is seen as neutral ground. So any, any thoughts on that front? Or Wes, if you've seen research in the space, feel free to chime in. I'll add one thought. Um, well, so it's a, it's a really important question, Antonio. Um, only about 8% of consumers know what a B Corporation is, recognize the B logo, so it's not clear that consumers are going to necessarily see it as polarizing. That said, if you think about a lot of these challenging issues, one way to de-escalate it is to bring it into the world of business. And what the B logo does, what B certification does, is simply build trust and accountability. That if we're going to make social and environmental claims, we have the policies and the data uh, to verify it. And you see that on both sides, that there's a lot of distrust of social and environmental claims that companies make. And they, these things are a dime a dozen. And what that certification does is it grounds it in uh, something that can be verified. And that idea of business being able to build trust on these issues is one way to de-escalate some of that tension and find some, uh, some common ground. So I think that that certification can play an important role um, of uh, uh, de-escalating some of that polarization. Excellent. It's good to know that uh, certification can be a, a common ground uh, uh, piece and de-escalator at this point. Any, any thoughts, Tuan or uh, Ali on that stuff? No, I wouldn't really add anything. I think it is still relatively new with everything else. I think there always seems to be a political lens that, that comes to it. But the fact that we are committing to making um, uh, what we do to have the public transparency that we've made a legal commitment that we want to focus on good to make an, a positive impact. I think most of the, the response that we're getting has been positive. And in fact, you know, it was mentioned earlier that people are seeking out B Corps, uh, certified B Corps, whether it's to um, find employment with those organizations. We're certainly seeing that as well in regards to recruiting and employing, uh, employees wanting to, you know, add that signature to their email address or, you know, we put it on agreements and things like that. So most of the response so far has been positive. We'll certainly want to monitor as this, um, as a movement continues to, to develop. Excellent. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, Jacob had a question about, you know, established uh, companies and, you know, in terms of hesitation um, for pursuit of certification. Is there any hesitation that, that either of you face maybe with board or leadership or, or stakeholders, anything you needed to demystify per se or answer um, for those to really buy in and move forward with your certification? Just wanted to see if you had any Thoughts on that and uh, how best to mitigate? Mm -hmm. I would say I was very lucky in the sense that when I arrived at Creature, everyone was very bought in um, all the way from the top to the bottom. And I know that's not the case for every business. And that was an exception. But what I would say is that communication with like board, the governance uh, structure, where however you were set up, I think what helped us is that when it did come time for that legal requirement that our board of directors already knew this entire process, they were getting updates throughout it. So when it came time to like actually amend those operating agreements, which is probably one of the 
you know, that's a big hurdle in the bee impact assessment to, you know, go from talking the talk to walking the walk and putting that into your operating agreement. And I think just that probably was the hardest, you know, group for us to have that final, you know, you got to get this done. So keeping them in the loop, going to those board meetings, providing updates on the certification. Um, and then also just that leadership buy-in was huge for us. No, oh, thank you for that. So that constant communication, I think, I think the legal, um, you know, structure and governance is always a, a thing that uh, people are careful about. So just educating folks on that. I know the Be Local Georgia has a great network of attorneys and others that are, are kind of versed in this. Um, and there's some good resources on the B Corporation uh, website as well. So with that, I think I see Pam jumping in. I don't think we got to all of our, our questions, but thank you to our, our panelists for the robust discussion. And we did drop a, a couple of links in the chat, which we, we hope are, are helpful. Obviously, um, B-Lab has a really robust website, um, various reports, directories. You can even peruse the B-Impact assessment. And I did notice some people said, I'm a nonprofit. You know, can I still learn from this? You know, B-Lab does not certify nonprofits, but um, Wes and I have explored the B-Impact assessment. It's something that nonprofits can take the principles and standards and, and definitely apply. You can't become a certified B Corp, but you can live the principles. So I will um, encourage everyone to kind of pursue that further. There's a lot of uh, great resources and frequently uh, asked questions, sections, things like that, that can help people. So Pam, I will turn it over to you and thank you to our panelists. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And um, also I will mention that the Business and Society Institute remains a great resource for the community. So thank you, Brian and Wes, for all the work you're doing. Thank you, uh, Tuan and Allie and Wes, for uh, serving as our panelists today with your just practical insights from both, you know, being in the space and working in it, and Wes, the tremendous amount of research and consulting that you're doing, and Brian, for your great facilitation for us this morning and keeping the conversation going. Before we sign off today, as always, I'd love to share um, just a few things that are coming up uh, for us in executive education. Uh, of course, this was our last uh, business over breakfast for 2021, and we're so glad that you were with us today. Returning for our only session in January, we're going to skip the first week in January because of the holidays. So on January the 20th, Tom Smith will come back for a reprise on the economy and me. What's been going on and how is it impacting our day-to-day -day lives? A quick preview of some of the upcoming short courses. We'll be having strategy visualization data visualization, and our managerial leadership program all coming up in the spring. Those are all going to be in person. We are so excited to have had our first fully in-person program running this very week. Um, we've had some hybrid programs running, so we've been having fun at the business school, and of course, that'll be subject to our COVID safety guidelines if that's able to happen. Also, we have our growth marketing certificate. You can sign up for these courses individually or to pursue the full certificate we hope you can check the, all of this out on our website, Executive Edu Emory Executive Education. And with that, we thank you again for joining us for our Business Over Breakfast series. And we wish all of you and yours a safe and happy holiday season. We look forward to seeing you in 2022 when we actually will be continuing our ESG series in the spring with a session on smart and sustainable investing. So we hope you will look for that to come. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful holiday season and get some rest. <laughs>